Uh, hello and welcome to the sixth edition of Superhero League. Um, I want to thank all of you for being uh, finally part of this. As you join, uh, you're going to see what we're going to do today. So uh, this started as a curious experiment a couple of weeks ago, like six weeks ago, and it turned out to be a regular broadcast. Um, today we're continuing with this tradition, so let's first go with a couple of basic things. So I would like to keep things interactive. We would like to keep things interactive, engaging and interesting. So we, and we encourage diversity in all aspects and especially in opinions. Please, if you have something to say, uh, don't be shy to jump in, uh, in the conversation at any time. You can freely turn on your camera and you know, participate in the discussion. If uh, for any reason you want to do so in the comments, my colleagues in the comments will be picking up questions and verbalizing it instead of you, uh, if you wish to do so. And this will happen also on YouTube and Facebook and all of the other streams that we're having right now. So just to show you how much we encourage uh, inclusivity and diversity and vocalizing your opinions, um, we decided to tip everyone who changes, changes their username uh, here in this room to a dot chain name and ask something meaningful or comment something meaningful. Uh, you will receive eight tokens for your contribution, just a fun game to kind of get you started. Um, for the best experience, please use Chrome and Firefox. If you're unable to uh, do so, please go to your uh, to our YouTube streams that will be in the comments or uh, shared on all of our media to do the best uh, uh, experience. Uh, so today, with uh, together with me as last time, I have my amazing colleague Mary, uh, who's going to everybody. So um, the idea of today is um, to check a couple of really important things. So currently, we're living in a world that is rapidly changing. Um, so from year in, in year out, we even without this current situation, um, and after this pandemic broke, broke, uh, the things were accelerating quite a lot, uh, really, really a lot. And that's why we're talking about the new normal and, uh, you know, things started, um, being implemented as they go. So we want to imagine today a world after the pandemic, uh, and where all our old status quo is now being pushed um, to change out of necessity and out of pragmatism. And we are seeing the largest experiments in the last 100 years uh, in front of our eyes. So we're talking about remote and digital work. Why we're talking about, um, you know, uh, education is being bring, brought online, uh, so many other things. So we can see it left and right. And one of the things that is a consequence of this is that paper is being eradicated from all aspects of our lives. Um, even the last bastions, like government agencies, old companies are shifting away out of necessity. So this is a great place to be if you want to instigate change. And, you know, the old paradigm shift, like the old uh, maxim, don't fix it if it's not broken, doesn't apply here. So this pandemic, all these illogical things broke and today's topic is to, to talk exactly about this so how do we improve on all of those things because we have been, been given an amazing opportunity to do so so um today we have a couple of amazing speakers and mary's and my job today would be to extract the best uh best of them and basically to step back before we start i have a, a small surprise um i just prepared a a short presentation just to reset the narrative really quickly uh, in exactly what we need. Before we have our speakers, Mary is going to uh, take over, uh, but allow me to have five minutes really shortly just to kind of wiggle your brain and, you know, prepare it for the best uh, for this. So give me a second to share it. And I'm not going to do the usual Zoom. Are you seeing my screen shared? <laughs> Things like this. I just want to say that, you know, I've been thinking about this for quite a while and even before the, the pandemic. And I realized one thing that our current modern political system that we are living in right now has been born during the Industrial Revolution. This is a long time ago. This is like 19th century, 20th, beginning of the 
20th century. It was a time of massive organizations and centralized control because this was the most efficient mechanism um, back then to govern things and to, to change. But what is happening right now is a new revolution, which is basically characterized by endless choice, digital technology, data, automation, AI, machine learning, blockchain, and all of these things. So what is happening as a consequence, uh, uh, consequence of this is the picture in the background. There's a huge change, a nuclear explosion, a good one, and our economy, our, our identity, political allegiances, even the essence of what is it, what it is to be a human are changing. So what, what is happening is that the current setup that we have right now uh, will clean for a while, like a legacy IT system that is usually too expensive to update. So, you know, we wait for the last moment to update it or switch to something else. But the thing that we're going through right now uh, shows us that it will soon become really redundant. So what is happening right now is technology-led restructuring of our politics and our society. And this is all being led, in my opinion, and hopefully yours, since you're joining this, uh, with blockchain. Blockchain technology is one of the fastest changing industries out there. Things are changing day to day, month to month, week on week. So the current current setup that we have is a normal thing to us. So what's happening for the past 10 years and more or less for the last year and then more or less for the last month, we're pushing the boundaries of what's possible and what's happening with tokenization assets, rethinking of the value, rethinking of the ownership, no new way to fund projects, rebuilding the governance systems. This is what we're going to talk about today, reaching consensus on a massive scale. And I believe that this is the whole, this whole thing is one of experiment in disruption. And this whole industry is one big fall. So I don't want to bore you for too long, but just one thing to remember. And, you know, look at the pyramids. Pyramids started, they were built more than 15,000 years ago. And the Egyptians who, who, who built it, they had, like, it was never about the tools they had because they didn't have dynamite, they had, didn't have bulldozers, they didn't have tools. They did it with ingenuity, creativity, and, like, human labor. So that's the whole, you know, narrative for today, in my opinion to think in those terms. Uh, in those terms, uh, so we can actually reimagine what are we gonna do today. So, uh, the idea today is to check exactly all these things. Um, so today's speakers are, um, uh, we have today wonderful speakers to talk about how do we transform the way that our governments and our governance works. Um, today joining us, we have uh, Justin uh, Grayside. I'm always butchering someone's names, but I hopefully I didn't butcher yours. Jason, uh, Justin, uh, Justin is joining us from Montevideo, Uruguay, and he is uh, one of the members of Digital Party in Uruguay. And we're having Ismael or Ismael Arribas uh, joining us from Spain. Uh, welcome. Welcome, Justin. Welcome, Ishmael. If you can turn on your cameras, that would be great. Justin is here. Ishmael, is it is he going to join? Okay. So the topic is really simple, and I'm going to start it, and you can jump in at any point. Transforming the way that government and governance works. So um, let's say, basically reimagine everything that before um, before seemed completely unchangeable from the ground up, the way that gov we govern ourselves. So basically, we choose our governments based on a four or five year cycle, and we select them. So basically, the government that we chose four years ago is now in a completely new situation, and we don't know if they're going to you know, do a good job or not. So we need a new way to conduct uh, interactions like this, conduct business, solve disputes, vote, uh, consume information and things like this. So, um, Justin and Ishmael, maybe we can start off a little bit by uh, having you introduce yourselves and what's your background and, you know, basically why are you relevant for this conversation today? Welcome. 
thanks for having us. I start to, to, to break the ice. Um, I, I came from the digital party. That is, a, it was a, it is a, an official political party in Uruguay. Uh, last year we had our first elections, our first national national elections, uh, where we aimed to uh, to get the, our seat, uh, one seat on the Congress. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, but it was a great first experience to start spreading the voice about this kind of, of experience of a digital party where we what we wanted to do is put a, a congress a congressman is going to be in in our case there and he was always to vote according to what was previously decided on an online platform where the voting part we're gonna we, we were going to do it uh, using blockchain so this is going to be uh, directly people choose online and our congressmen always were going to uh, always uh, was going to to do the thing that was voted online this of course sparked a lot of discussions and debates uh, na nationwide i think we, we we accomplished the first objective to make our voice heard everyone here knows about the digital party i don't know if they understand what it really means for the, their daily lives so it's a, a work in progress. Good. So, Ismael, hello, welcome. If you could tell us a little bit of, about your background. So, uh, okay. it seems Ismael okay. is disconnected. He will be back really soon. So, Justin, um, Luca was mentioning before that, that, that things are happening like really, really fast, right? Um, th things used to happen gra gradually, changes for people should, have, uh, should be gradual, but this situation is, is made everything faster and we need to adapt, right? Totally. So um, at the beginning of the digital party, uh, my perception from the outside, it was like people thought of, of you guys as a bunch of crazy people that tried to rule the country through social media and then uh, people started to understand a little bit more what liquid democracy means and to have someone represent you but instead of you putting all your trust on that person that person is an enabler for you to every time that something is going to be voted let your voice up uh, be heard and have your opinion right we even developed uh, uh, together with Omar uh, some pl a platform in order to this be accomplished through eternity blockchain to make it also very transparent and secure so um how did you get to, pe to people to understand you know as, as a party with your communication to understand and how was that process that people actually started to understand and voted for you even if you didn't get a seat how did you get people to understand about liquid democracy do you think that society is ready for that concept uh, okay, m m many questions in one, so I I'm going to start with the, by, uh, by the first one. Uh, I think that the people that voted for us, uh, that there were more than 6,000, um, I mean, they, 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 I think they had a, or, or a previous te uh, technological background that they made them feel comfortable discussing the, the, this kind of things, or became from a huge disappointment with some political options, so they were trying to find uh, some new, really, really, and radically new option from the status quo, different from the status quo. So I think this was the, the two kind of voters that we that we had. The process to make them understand our idea, I think, is a is a is a large pro process. And if we think about, uh, I came as well from from marketing. I I've been working in, in marketing with. Uh, technological companies for, for many years now and when we think about the marketing funnel the first step is awareness after that is consideration or interest on both and after that conversion if we take this to the election the first one is awareness I think we accomplish that uh, but many people are still there in the consideration interest where where they really have to understand what it really means for them on the on the daily lives so i think for the people that were looking just for another option we make a, a great impact and some of them vote for us voted for us but the people that they were looking for a more short-term solution 
to their daily problems, we didn't make an impact. And that is something that we have to keep uh, working on. And the main challenge here for this type of, of options is to focus on communication and focus on, on really encourage this kind of debate. Because if we just keep our service, thinking about the tool, thinking about the platform, the technology, and we fill our, our speeches with blockchain and insecurity and reliability, that is great. But this, is, this by itself is not going to solve people's problems. We have to move some step forward to try to, uh, to, to, to demand our service to think, OK, how this is going to improve uh, uh, people's problems and how they are, it's going to improve this daily life and how they are going to be an active part of, of this. And this is that I think that we didn't accomplish that on the, main, on the last election, but we keep working on it so we can accomplish on the next one. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, Ishmael back. Hello. Ishmael, are you here? And welcoming Ishmael once more again. If you are here, just uh, let us know by speaking. And I'm guessing he is going to um, join in a second again. So, um, uh, just one question from my side. So um, we have we have the part party here in Europe, um, and one of the biggest issues with the part party was that too many people, too many different different agendas, too many, too big of a chaos. And it in at least in my country in Croatia, the things didn't turn out that well. But um, one of the things that it's kind of uh, showed is how fragile this Vox Populi system can be. So, but on on, the, on another hand, this started um, six uh, five years ago. So now we have this technology, and we have people who are let's say fit to make some decisions, at least short short term decisions. How do you think this whole thing is going to evolve in the next couple of years? Specifically thinking about this liquid democracy, and if you can if you can explain to to everyone joining us what is actually a liquid democracy as a, as a concept. Okay, perfect. I want to start just making a comment about the the, the pirate parties that you mentioned. Um, I think that the main the main thing to I think that the pirate parties should make better. Uh, and two years ago, I I, I meet uh, uh, Brigitte Konzotir. I don't know if it is well said. Is the founder of the Pirate Party in Iceland, and we were discussing about this, and I think and he was uh, really sad uh, because some of their representatives and leaders within the, the Pirate Party they were pursuing their own personal agenda and not following what the what the people really want, and I think that there there was no uh, mechanisms that uh, demand and make it mandatory for the rep representatives that they have to do what the people want. They have in their speech the direct their democracy speech. It's not made, not made of the party of the pirate parties about direct democracy, not liquid democracy itself. But they don't have the uh, obligation to always act accordingly with the with what the with what the the people decided. So I think that is different. What we want to do with the digital party, a liquid democracy, where it is is. The ability to that you can vote, you can you can propose any ideas, and you have the, the opportunity to propose any ideas and take it into the political the political area to propose any ideas for laws for uh, uh, public policies. And if you don't consider that you are the best person to vote on some matter, you can delegate your vote to another person that you consider. Um, I have a friend that is the best in economics. Okay. I, I, I'm humble, I humble enough to say I don't know so much about economics. I'm going to delegate my vote to my friend, and he's going to vote for him and for me. That is really basic what a, what a liquid democracy is. Hello? Do you Good, understood. Uh, right I want to check if we have Ismael there. Ismael, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Do I can see me? him. I'm here. Yes, but I'm here. yes, could you please turn, turn your yeah, video you on? Me. Okay. 
I am having problems with Super. configuration. So welcome, uh, I, I, I changed various times devices Not a problem. to join this instant discussion. First of all, I want to, to give a, a, oh, that's that's cool. A word of sentiment because of this COVID worldwide. So all oh. my best energy to yeah. all of you there. And and, and I want to come to the point of our discussion because uh, I was listening, but unfortunately I couldn't interact. For me, it's about uh, fundamental rights and human rights. We are talking here about the right to freedom of association, which is involved in, in, in many international declarations and even though breach the theory of democracy and civil society with the libertarian one and so on so uh, i want to go more in profound because uh, my effort since i am entrepreneur is not just giving ideas to government i am trying to react to make them react and i am involved in many freaky projects even i represent my country for the standardization developing bodies which i think could be a good opportunity to take advantage because my freedom of association is breached by uncertainty of law regulation or something like that i cannot join with one associate i trust on him because of the regulatory barriers for instance that's wrong that's why i entered into the space of the decentralized autonomous communities and so on so interesting. I mean, we're going to talk talk about this a little bit uh, in the in the not a little bit, but a lot in the second topic in you know, reimagining the the system. But let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. So, how do you, Ishmael? How do you like? You're living in Spain. Spain is this, uh, you know, a, a, a country with uh, centuries of of, of um, uh, history and democratic uh, and monarchic, uh, you know, uh, uh, legacies. How do you see that we are going to transition from this current state we are in, in the current system, uh, in the next couple of years? Can you imagine what's going to happen in, let's say, in, in, in five years? How are we, are we still going to vote every four years for the members of the parliament and then the sub-parliament and things like this? Or are we going to tra transition into something more? Are we going to use DAOs? What is, in your opinion, let's say, the future of governance in this case? Uh... Mm, there it is a change of paradigm with the concept of governance because uh, with blockchain and the centralized environment we are talking about control not only administration and direct and this is what our colleague about liquid democracy was appointed about that control but if we don't have the ability to train educate from different perspectives or facets of our society to the officials, I don't talk about politicians. I am talking about those one who choose to work for the country and get their salary in a regular basis for the whole of their life and being retired and finished and give their best efforts, let's say, whoever is the control politician side. Uh, they need to be trained because sometimes they are confused by the instructions, by the strategies. They implement some the strategies, change the government, they, these strategies stand by, and those efforts change. This is one hindrance that natural human beings need to resolve with governments. Because at the end of the day, we choose our parties. Good. Um, so we, we need to train them. Understood. Ismael, I would like to ask you a question. The uh, maybe also, Justin, I would like to see your your point of view here. Abraham Lincoln said that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Is liquid democracy the continuation, the next step of this quote? What do you think, Justin? I don't know if it is the continuation. Is the, is, I think it is the implementation the truly uh, implementation of that. Uh, because right now it's not so...
so by the people, I think it's so by the politicians, of course the people, they are not animals, but it's sometimes there's a huge gap between politicians and the people and the, their, their truly problems. And so, so I think digital democracy, liquid democracy is a necessity uh, for this to take that into, into reality and we need that to make the decision makers really decide what is best what is best for the people and not not only the, the stakeholders that they, they talk to. And I think the other opportunity that sometimes we don't take so much into consideration is that many people from different backgrounds has a lot of ideas to propose to this new reality. I mean, I can think about how many a lot of experts that uh, that I are right now here in this in this conference. Maybe you don't like to be involved in a typical political campaign, and that is why you don't uh, propose ideas to your representatives. But if you could have the opportunity to, from your house, propose your ideas, you could do that. And you probably you would do that. And this is the same from people that know a lot about artificial intelligence, a new kind of transportation and environmental issues or whatever, that maybe they are not now motivated to be an active part in the political process. So I think it's really a necessity for, for our reality that is moving so fast and needs knowledge from different, different backgrounds that the politicians, they didn't have it. Yeah, I agree. And, and I take that, that quote from you, you know, it's, it's, it would be to first, the first time to implement what Lincoln was mentioning. I agree on that. Okay. And Ismael, what do you feel about this? Is uh, also regarding what, what Justin just said, what's your opinion on that? Is it the next step for people to have their voice? Mm, I am not sure. Uh, I, I do get the point of uh, Justin. Uh, but uh, I came back for the freedom of association. Uh, for instance, if you want to be governed by a time of period, this governance mm, in, in terms of blockchain or, or DLT environments can be terminated. So has got uh, uh, some principles and purposes which is different. If you want freedom of money, for instance, a kind of, 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 of libertarian environment, this is another kind of governance. So it's your choice, a human being as individual, to select which kind of environment and what kind of democracy you want to be involved. And thanks to blockchain, we can automate it, this trust between each other. So this is the freedom I am talking. So I am more coming to the fundamentals of what for what we want governance for what parcel of your life you want the governance if you want for money if you want for project if you want for being governed it's up to you this is this is my idea but i support all the words of our colleague justin in in, in that part Good, good. It's a different point of view and really interesting as well. We also have a, in the chat, we encourage you people to ask questions in our chat. Uh, the superhero team is moderating the chat for, to receive your questions. If you are watching live through Facebook or YouTube as well, you can comment and leave your questions. We have a question from Gonzalo that says, do end users will feel more motivated to participate in the election processes by liquid democracy techniques? Who, which one of you would like to take that question? <laughs> Luca, go ahead, Luca. Let me try, let me try because I think it's very connected to mine. Like I'm coming from the, the, the Balkans, like the, the worst place on the earth if you ask the people from the Balkans. And <laughs> one of the like universal things that, that people in the Balkans have, the only one is a severe distrust of the governments. Like nobody believes in the governments for one reason alone is because nobody believes that anything can be changed by casting a vote very little people believe so. So um, people are not mo motivated to vote. People are not motivated to make any change because the history of the last 100 years showed us that whatever we do, nothing can be changed. So, and the reason why is it because people have short memories. And the reason why people have short memories is because of this four-year cycle. And if liquid democracy or any, any equivalent of this uh, is being in, uh, introduced. So if I can revoke my vote, um, so I vote regularly because I think that this is, this is an important part of, 
of, of our system. It's important part of our system. I need to verbalize my thoughts um, about things that I agree and disagree, and usually disagree with majority of the things. But still, if there is a, 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 a process, election process, that can say, I disagree with what you just said, Luca. Luca is an idiot. Revoke my vote for Luca's decision on introducing the quarantine or revoke my vote for Luca to make a decision on this or on that. I think this will create a little bit more chaos, but a, a much more justice and a, a much more trust in the system itself. So I don't know. What do you guys think? What, Ishmael and, and, and Justin, I, I, you know, this is one of the things that I strongly believe and I strongly need, you know, in this part. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, I think it depends on the on the country because, for example, I think here in Uruguay, the, the, there's a it is really different because we we love to vote. We are we have we are three million of uh, football fans and politics fans, uh, so we love to go to the, to the ballots and put our our option every five years. So, but I think that is. I, it's not related if we think or not that our vote is going to change anything. We just create this, I think the, the, the poli uh, politicians here and the political parties that are one of the oldest in the world uh, have done a great job creating a, a sense of belonging for different options. So there are people that like to discuss, to take part of, of any options. So there is a, a huge uh, environment around, around that. But and I think in Latin America, it's really really similar to that because a lot of people like to discuss about about politics i know in europe in some part of europe it's really it's really different but uh, related what would you say and what we uh, gonzalo was was asking i think liquid democracy definitely is gonna increase people willing to take part of this kind of uh, of discussion of these public discussions but for example in uruguay they are not gonna make them vote more because we already vote a lot but for uh, maybe in the Balkans, yeah, they do, and they make that that effect. But not only every four uh, four years or five years, if, but any time they have something important to say and to vote, I maybe revoke your vote, Luca, because you are you you are voting something silly. I don't know, but and that, that, that is part of the discussion. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it could make a, a positive impact, definitely. And I think another, the, the, I'm watching the, the, the chat and there's a lot of really interesting questions. By the way, dot chain names, all of the good questions get tipped by A tokens. Um, so the connection is, let's say, let's we imagine that we create a new parliamentary system that says, okay, here's liquid democracy. Whoever is voted up can make decisions. What are the potential areas of concern when applying this liquid democracy techniques uh, for end, like end user requirements of I don't know, existing decisions. Let's say we want to vote on something which is quite important. Is there any concerns, um, you know, grave ones, because these are important decisions in application of liquid democracy out there, both to you, Ishmael, and both to you, Justin? Uh, I will take I have an uh, answer, but I, I don't want to... Go, go, Justin. Yeah, go, 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 go. I don't want to interrupt your brainstorming. Go, go, go. I continue after you. Go, Justin, please. Okay, 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 okay. thanks. Uh, you know, I, I, I can share with what, what we learned from the past uh, campaign, and the main concern, the main, the main concern, and it gives a, a lot of, of, of topics to debate about, is that people is not well, is not educated enough to make decisions. Uh, we know, we believe on this uh, romantic idea that everybody that consider that themselves, I, I, they don't know about anything, they're going to delegate the vote. But here in Uruguay, we don't trust a lot of, uh, we don't trust many of the, the, the other people. And of course, everybody knows and consider that you're not going to delegate your vote. You're going to vote, even if you know about the topic and even if you don't. And that is the main concern. That is the main fear that people that maybe they don't know about anything are going about are going about yeah we should end the quarantine right now i'm going to go out out and that is the main the main fear of a digital populism and that is a, i think it's a huge topic that we should work uh, on it what you're saying justin raises a question because here in uruguay uh voting is compulsory compulsory it's mandatory right yeah. 
what happens, and maybe Ismael could answer this question, what happens with liquid democracy in countries where it's not um, compulsory to, to vote, where it's, it's not mandatory to vote? Is it more adjusted, uh, liquid democracy is more adjusted to these countries' concepts? Uh, what do you feel about that, Ismael? Thank you, Mariana. I appreciate your question because I will join with the previous one, my thoughts. I was thinking about participation. For what you vote? If you are not motivated to vote, it's because it's not priority in your life. It's because you have a mot an extra motivation to uh, can be able to vote. Okay, that could be a minimum. If you want to vote, you are talking about democracy and you want to vote and you don't demonstrate this attitude of participate in this voting is a character of being considered. For instance, I don't want to make any kind of a spoiler here of any projects I am involved, but it is one in particular. Uh, I was hired to check, deploy their uh, governance modeling, and they are looking for uh, chemistry formulas. Very interesting, whereby our system retro uh, give nutrient nutritives to participate if you don't participate other one could be automatically go into that delegation because they wish to participate so it's another way to tell in quorum participation and i think i i, I really i am a believer of the cause for the free will i mean why you want to vote why it's necessary to be governed under this so this gives you the idea of the importance of voting so the scope is very much aligned what we are talking here is about education i understand uh, there's some uh, um, Tina, is, uh, that we also have so we have tima tima raised his hand tima can you you, you can turn on your uh microphone from the chat so turn on your Should microphone I? and camera and you can speak up yes absolutely okay. Hey guys, uh, I was thinking about quadratic voting because that's a mechanism that is used for funding, but it could be used pretty well for voting. So the idea is that uh, not all votes are equal and the more votes we, we have from different people, the more significant and important it is. That way it is pretty hard to buy votes from someone else because even if you buy a few votes, after that, if only a few people vote for the other side, they can completely change the vote. And of course, uh, this is solving the problem with, for example, a few people uh, have to decide where will be the new office of the company. And for some people, for example, it's very important to, to select the office to be near to, to their home or whatever. But for some other guys, it's not important. And they say, I don't care, I, I'm not going to vote. But after that, uh, when even one vote can change the whole uh, decision, maybe some of them friends could ask them and tell them, okay, if you vote, this will bring us like 10 or 20 more points. So it's pretty important to vote. Your, your vote is not just one of thousands and your vote is really important and it will give us some significant uh, weight to the final decision. So, yeah, this is one of the ideas that I hear. And, yeah, it's inspired by Vitalik Buterin and some other guys from ETH community. So it sounds like an incentive for voters or when we decide to fund something. Because every vote counts and it's important. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is a very interesting, interesting proposition. And this is one of the, let's say, controlling mechanisms to prevent the bad things happening. Because that was my concern. Liquid democracy is fine unless you have a digital populist, that Justin said, um, a digital version of Donald Trump, Donald Trump um, you know, good or bad, it doesn't matter, uh, who says, okay, um, you know, I'm going to give everyone $500 if you vote for this option and things, things like this. So, again, um, we have an interesting comment uh, from Diego Zupardi. Uh, it, 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 so, two things. First, suddenly, if more communication channels begin to be generated to encourage participation in liquid democracy, people would begin to understand and see the importance of the tool, which I agree 100%. Formerly, in places where the direct democracy was used, 
it was an obligation to exercise it for the citizens. This gives us an intermediate path to put in some way. So Diego, if you want to jump and you know expand on this, more than welcome. Uh, turn on your microphone and join us. Um, if not, I can ramble upon uh, on this uh, many, many uh, hours on this. But I think um, two things about this is that we already have um, like one of the closest ones is a direct democracy happening in Switzerland, in all of the cantons, like people directly vote there. And some of the decisions are good and some of the decisions are bad, but this is what a, the liquid or direct democracy is. So like there is no left, like good or bad in these decisions. So I know that they had, we have two panels from now or chats from now, we're going to have two amazing uh, minds talking about automation and UBI and uh, like universal basic income and Switzerland was I think one of the first major countries to vote on this and again this connects to all of your comments if you have a direct incentive let's say I'm a wealthy person that pays a lot of taxes and my incentive could be on one hand oh I don't want to pay taxes because they're going to go to those people who don't work for whatever reason so but on the other hand you know, so it's it, it, it's a constant struggle in the game of like um, incentives on left and right that, you know, makes this decisions significantly stronger and significantly, um, I would say, more just. So, yeah. Um, I, 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 Luca, I just want to add a, a comment on that. Uh, I think uh, to, to think and to design uh, an effective and, and responsible uh, liquid democracy process uh, on the society, there has to be a key area of developing an educational process parallel to the decision making process. Because it's key, it's key that we educate. And I think a good liquid democracy is going to make people more educated as well. So it's not just about the technology, the technology is the ground to build this liquid democracy above, above it. But above, above it, we have to, uh, to create and encourage more educated citizens and try to design this process and ask ourselves when we're designing it, okay, how people are going to learn about it? How can people are going to finish this decision making process learning something else? So they're going to be more educated for the next one. And think about our service, all of us. We now know a bit about pandemics, about a bit coronavirus, about the spreading rate and whatever. And some months ago, we didn't know anything about it. So anyone can learn about a different topic as uh, this is if we have the motivation to do so. Now is the public health, our own health. But maybe if you know that your vote is going to make an impact on your daily life, you're going to learn a more, a more. And of course, of course, because you, you want to debate and you want to win every debate and not win with your friends. So you want better information. So you, we, want to dis, we have to design this process trying, trying to align those incentives that they want to participate, but they want to be educated in the process as well. Yeah, you know, that thing is the <clears throat> no, because blow my mind with one effort I detected uh, three years ago. It's standards. I had no idea in that time what the standards was uh, in terms of harmonized regulatory efforts with technology. And uh, when I started, I uh, entered a different developing bodies of the world with different roles and so on. Uh, Two years later, I realized that the standards is like uh, you have your moral, which is your minimal correct behavior, and then you have your ethic, which is your best efforts on your behavior. These are standards, are volunteer to fulfill, and will motivate. It's a kind of incentive out of law. Just want to mention the importance in my life and my opinion with my experience about the standards in a proper way as a solution. I think very, very cool that you, you, you mentioned this. And I just want to connect it to, to one of the earlier statements that you made is that the education of the people, like we need, like you, you were mentioning politicians, but I think it applies to the whole, whole population. If you don't know how to use the tool, yes. 
uh, you you cannot fulfill the full potential. And for us, I just realized this. It was a kind of a revelation. Is that because we know what's liquid democracy, and because we know a little bit about the pandemics, and a little bit about this, and a little bit about that, we think like we have this bias that things are like that. Our decision is a little bit more worthy than someone who doesn't. And the only difference between us and them is this like grain of knowledge that we have over them. So I think for the practical applications of this, um, I think Agreed. education and teaching is absolutely essential. Uh, and Agreed. otherwise, otherwise, all of the decisions would be made by politicians, professional politicians, and people who are educated in the political economy and all of these things around that. So I think that would be a takeaway for me. You know, this is one of the things that I've learned here, and I thought, you know, I, I'm quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable yeah, about really, the sun. That's, um, that's really interesting, Luca. I was also thinking uh, that in in the aim of educating others so that they can vote. Um, you would take a little bit the power off the politicians and every citizen that would have an idea, want to debate, would use, I believe, uh, social media to educate, uh, to put their ideas on debate. So probably it would be a richer debate and you, they, would, they would arise new politicians, right? And not only this uh, small circle that is close to politics and can access politics, but all the population could could be like influencers, you know, like political influencers, and use that power to educate people and to debate. So surely the the debate would be much more, it would be richer, definitely, definitely. Absolutely. So I think uh, this conversation has been amazing. But we need to we need to to go into the next one, right? So it's all yes, yours. absolutely. Uh, but thank, thank you very much. Thank. Thank you very much for participating. Hopefully, we're going to get to continue this discussion later on on a little bit, a little bit more uh, elevated level. Uh, Justin, thank you so much. Ishmael, thank you very much for participating in this. Uh, 20 minutes is a very short time. But it, yes, uh, I think 20 minutes is, 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 is barely enough to touch the surface, but I think we kind of touched really a couple of important points here. And I'm going to ping you, all, like all of you, to join us in one of the next editions, one of the next broadcasts that we're going to have. So uh, thank you so much. And we are now continuing to our next topic. Uh, and our next topic is the same. The theme is the same. Um, we are in really a unique situation. Things are inevitably changing, left and right. And now we have the time to kind of push some decisions or some changes that could make, uh, uh, you know, a great world of, of difference. So we are continuing on now with a, a fire strike chat with um, about how can we reimagine our legal system. Uh, Ishmael is continuing with us because Ishmael, from my understanding, you are a legal uh, lawyer by, by, by trade or by education. And we are having Vlaho joining us um, from Croatia. I saw you earlier in the chat. Vlaho, if you're here, you can turn on your camera. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, but the camera won't start. I don't know why. Okay, uh, never mind. Voice is also and fine. I, I, I dressed in, in my good shirt, so I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you so much both again for joining us. So we started talking about governments and we started talking about governance in general. How do people like lead and vote? And one of the main reasons why we have governance is to pass laws. And we all know about um, two ways. So like the, 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 the common system and the natural system. So um, we can all agree that currently we have a lot of inefficiencies in our legal system. And when I say our legal system, I mean globally. I, I haven't met any of the legal system um, which are perfect or ideal. Uh, they have been honed by many, many years. But, you know, I think we are living in a world that, you know, things need to be pushed by the end boundaries. So the good part about this, the law is like a living organism. The ju judiciary system is a li living organism. If it can change, it can change if it detects more efficient things and more efficient way of doing things. So my question to Ishmael and my question to, 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 to Vlaho would be the following. So if, bear with me, because this is going to be a long stretch. So if today was 1997, and I would ask you, how will the internet change our legal system? You would probably say teleconferencing, we could have, you know, hearings online, 
you know, we could have digitally signed contracts. We don't need paper anymore. We could get a lawyer's advice via, you know, lawyers and app like this. So I want you to do the following thing. Imagine practicing law in 2022. How can we push our judicial and legal system to be improved 10x looking from today, especially having blockchain, smart contracts, DAOs, governance, and all of the good and bad things coming from this in mind? So what do you think? How, how does 2022 look from a lawyer's perspective? Ideal case scenario. I will give the floor to Laco first because I came from the previous. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if, if you'd like the the honest answer or the answer that will make you honest. feel good because I the can honest answer both. Always. Yeah, I, I don't think anything will change. Not in two years, not in five years, not in ten years uh, with the legal system. The changes will be cosmetical, so to speak, uh, the same way that uh, the lawyers are now using computers instead, inst instead of the typing machines, instead of, instead of typewriters. But fundamentally, nothing has changed in the 25 or 30 years before. And I really don't see it changing uh, so easily because this is a, a law, generally, judicial systems are so old, and which is the less, less of a problem because that guarantees some sort of quality. But the biggest problem is that they're run by a bunch of um, anal types who are uh, really, you know, generally boomers who are only keen to keep things as they are. And that is a big problem because you always need some young revolutionary force in order to change something which cannot happen in the judicial system because you cannot become a judge when you're 25. And once you became a judge when you are 55, you're really out of ideals and out of this juvenile energy. So uh, I, I was a couple of times uh, reprimanded for, for being uh, anti, I know it's called uh, anti-old people. Uh, I know there's a word for it, uh, ageist, ageism. Um, ageism. Yeah, ageism. Yeah. I, I really am not. I'm really for the equality because I, I spoke several times and I never, I never, f but ex except what I said was being uh, considered really rude, but I never found an explanation of why do we uh, uh, forbid people uh, for the first 18 years to vote, but we are not forbidding the people in their last 18 years to vote. So you don't, you don't, we don't uh, think that someone age 16 uh, is smart enough to decide on the future of the planet that is there for him. We always say, you know, like the world remains for the young people, but we don't let them take part in it. Okay, I'll take the floor then, right? Uh, I could distinguish two areas. One, public law, and then private law. But both of them, any countries you live, would have the same problem because our uh, civil society evolve. Uh, which is a kind of needs of deslegalization. There are a lot of laws, a lot of laws, a lot of laws. Technology disrupt, new laws are necessary, but what happened with the other laws? So there are a lot of laws. There is a mess of laws. Even I don't think any citizen in their own country, their own village could follow what are the laws that are implemented locally in the regions or so on or in their country daily basis? Not at all. Uh, uh, so uh, if you ask me for 2022, uh, it's necessary to make a revision of the uh, uh, needs to deslegalize barriers because you can create new laws, but if you don't, uh, turn down those barriers of old obsolete laws will affect as well because you are under limitation not modern not freedom again coming to the fundamental rights i talk at the beginning that's my only addition to my colleague and this is this is one this is very interesting because we have two like two very similar opinions coming from the same same direction is what you are saying and i'm going to interpret it and excuse me if i'm wrong is that the way like the barriers of change are 
um, basically old people who refuse, who love the status quo and refuse to change and adapt because it's something that it's something very unfamiliar to them. So I'm referring to, for example, um, like I'm now 40, 20 years from now, I'm going to be 60, 60 years from now, uh, 20 years from now, there's probably my kids and, you know, grandchildren, hopefully one day, uh, they're going to have this, I don't know, hologram, laser, neural, you know, things that I'm going to detest because they were invented after, you know, I stopped absorbing um, technology and new way of doing things. So does it mean that we need to change our complete, like, judicial system in terms of people or does it mean um, um, basically that the old people can adjust and adapt like i don't know people who are 65 years old and start using a smartphone or a laptop or a phone. i'm looking at it from this perspective uh, uh, adapting and uh, and uh, creating the rules for the world are two different things i'm sure i'm more than happy that someone uh, who is older, adapts and uses smartphone and uh, embraces the technology. I just think that he is not able to envisage the future because he is already past his prime years. And uh, he shouldn't be telling someone who is to inherit the world what this world will look like. Yeah, I mean, on, on, on that point, I think I tend to agree. If But, you know, this is the thing. Um, I wonder what my opinion will be like 20 years from now, when I'll be 60. You know, I'll tell you, it will be the same as mine. We won't agree with ourselves from 2020. We will say that but, we were young and green and that only the experienced people should govern the world. You know? Does anybody in the, in, in the audience have a different opinion? Because I, like, I hate to, you know, and Gabriel is, is saying in the chat, adapt or die. I tend to agree with this 100%. But on the other hand, look, one of the things that I was taught by my grandfather is that <clears throat> if you don't study the past, you're bound to, you know, make the same mistakes, stupid mistakes, avoidable mistakes. So there is a balance that needs to be done here, I think. However, I'm like drawn to the concepts of liquid democracy. I don't know, using smart contracts in instead of like uh, paper contracts and things, things like this. I think... Uh, we have a lot of things which we really don't understand and a lot of threats that we, that we don't understand. And this is not software and code. These are lives, economies that, that are actually impacted by this. So let's ignore the 2022. Let's, let's look at 2030. It sounds a lot, but this is 10 years ago. And this is 2010, which is not that far away in my brain. Um, so, Vlaho, how old were you in 2010? In 2010, I was 26. 26. So you were just fresh out of law school, right? Uh, no, uh, to, in, to, in, 2000, in 2010, I was already in the second year of my internship. Okay, I second year of your internship. 2008, yeah. So 10 years passed. A lot of things changed or no things changed? Legally, what, like, no things changed. The, the way how the system works has not changed one bit. Okay, so... A question for both of you. What can we do now in the next couple of years, let's say a decade, to radically change the way that our judiciary system works? Yes, like impossible or not impossible? Mm. I, I, I would say th there is something that I'm really, really against more than anything in the world, which is dictatorship and uh, despotic rules and something like that. But there was a part in the Greek history when Pericles took over and it was like the golden age, but he had all the power in his, in his hand. So I think you would now need to have this one person uh, who is of high virtue, who would be able to temporarily circumvent some of the rules of democracy in order to uh, make everything all right. But I, I think this is from the domain of speculating and wishful thinking. I don't think this will ever happen. I would be the first person who would be against putting the power in the hands of one person. But generally, I don't see anything happening without radical, uh, <laughs> radical moves like in Croatia, this would mean firing like 85% of all judges from all the courts. And this, is, this isn't something that will ever happen. Let me, let me reset. Let me reset because I think in Spain is the situation is the same. So right now, what is happening in this time of history is now we have the pandemic. 
It is an economical reset. The situation on the ground is there is social, social dis distancing. There is no more papers. There is no more long lines. There is no more court hearings. Uh, and disputes are going way down because th people are thinking about different things. The same thing that happens in war. So, in my opinion, this would be the right, like, the perfect time in the history to change all of these things. To, like, so this is a gift from heaven for to change something, but I still don't think it will happen. I think people are all people want is for things to go back to as what they were because this is something they're familiar with. Even if it's bad, we know how it works. But what if we can't? What if the situation like dictates that there's no way that we cannot go back, that we can back, uh, go back to the old way of doing things? What if this cycle repeats every three months and we need to find a way to adapt to the situation? I mean, this is like, like this is what ifs and what would this ifs produce in the end? This is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to instigate here. Yeah, um, you know, Luca, regarding what you were saying, um, we can agree to disagree with Blaho here. Um, in my opinion, it, it's a, a point in history where things are going to change and uh, and we need to take that opportunity. And it also leads to this, the next topic that we're going to address uh, regarding automation and, and UBI. But uh, society is has has been forced to embrace change and new rules in very few days and globally they have adapted so society in my opinion has proved that they are ready for fast change they are ready for change of paradigm you know what i mean so this involves law as well we cannot uh continue to have these very long long processes to solve things because it's not sustainable anymore and maybe two months ago, if you would want to push uh, some changes regarding law and digitalizing um, these aspects, people would have resist. But from my point of view, we are moving into a next era where people have been shown that things need to move faster, that we can adapt. It was like Gabriel was saying, you know, adapt or die. So I think that we have like a good situation here to, to, to move there. And of course, some, pe some people are game changers and some people are always going to be uh, trying to, to go back to normal because normal is safe, normal is uh, what, what we want. But it is the game changers that make things happen. You know, what, what we say here, join the conversation. Uh, I would like to not to monopolize the, the conversation and here um, there no. are some points in the chat. I don't know if they are regarding... Um, Albina says the first thing Bulgarian authorities did after introducing the state of emergency was to suspend judiciary. Here it happened the same thing. I'm based in Uruguay. The judiciary was suspended because the way it works, it needs to be suspended. You need to be there physically. So uh, a really interesting uh, input from Albina. And maybe you could read the next one, uh, Luca. So uh, Vlaho did was was the same thing in in, in Croatia. Did was the judiciary mm, suspended? No, no, it the, wasn't suspended, the... but it failed the test. Uh, namely, the constitutional court uh, remained silent when the, this so-called uh, they formed uh, an ad hoc body called uh, you know Luka in Croatian closure, which is like the headquarters of the of this mm -hmm. uh, couple of people who are running the crisis. Yeah, emergency, and they emergency, decided yeah. that they will. Um, uh, cancel several uh, constitutional rights, you know, you know, one of them being the freedom of movement. So you can't move from one city to another. And the Croatian constitution says that uh, the only body that can uh, uh, temporarily suspend such highly valued uh, constitutional rights is the Croatian parliament. And so you have a situation where a body of three people circumvents the Croatian parliament and the constitutional court remains silent. So judiciary, judiciary didn't have to be suspended because it uh, chose not to speak. So that's Horrible. what happened here. Ishmael, you wanted to you wanted to add up on this, right? Yes, uh, I want to come up uh, to the to the cycle we were talking. <coughs> sorry, uh, before because, uh, for instance, in my country, we react later. To be honest, because uh, we were 
watching the things. But uh, mm -hmm. coming to the environment of the European space, we are again conditioned, under condition in our economy. One of the post impact will be the economic crisis. Every country, we need support from where? Europe. So there is a kind of super governance framework coming to our topic, whereby our countries declare some emergency situations and so on and react accordingly with this other kind of democracy. Do you think that in my country, I would say 30% of my population are thinking as European? This is Spain. Uh, the, we are Latins like yours. Uh, we live lives. We want like uh, this kind of fundamental rights to be preserved. It's more profound, our passion, let's say, in other Eastern areas are affected, like uh, we are listening here. But we are conditioned by this super governance of the European framework in the European Union, for instance. I just want to highlight that point because the emergency is a politician decision, it's a political decision that one country uh, like uh, Bulgaria were thinking about judiciary. I don't know really, to be honest, if they were suspended or no. In our case, were suspended the, uh, uh, the colleagues' education. Why? Education was cut off. But fortunately, children and my, my, my children, I have my children inside as entrepreneur, uh, uh, works a lot on remote because we are on the 21 century. That's my reflection on this topic. Yeah, and thank you for this because I think it's very important to kind of highlight all of these things. And I think the conclusion of this at the end of the, 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 the today's session, I'm going to try to draw some conclusions uh, after this. I just want to thank, thank you so much, Vlaho, and thank you, Ishmael, once again for joining us. Thank you. For it was very refreshing to see to see uh, opinions from both ends. And I hope you're gonna join us next week uh, on this. We're continuing on with uh, the, uh, the um, next topic or the next Fireside Chat. We are having Andrea um, Kali, uh, Dr. Andrea Kali from uh, Pomodoro and Jan Liedermann from UBIC. I hope I pronounced that right. If I butchered her name again, I'm very sorry. I'm so bad at names. Uh, Andrea, I can see you. Uh, Jan, I saw you in the in the chat recently, but uh, yeah. So um, the topic, yeah, the topic of the. Uh, can you hear me? Because I yes, think there are two Jans. Ah, okay. We can hear you if you want. You can turn on your camera if you you, you can stay off if you have any issues. So uh, welcome to to Superhero League, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Andre is joining us from London and Jan is joining us from Berlin. Um, so hopefully we're going to have a very interesting chat. So let me just rephrase. Hope you enjoyed the first couple of topics. Uh, I mean, 20 minutes is really short time to dig into the topic. But the idea is to have like in the networking session later, we stay and we discuss, you know, opposing opinions and things like this after the conclusions. But for, for this chat, um, we're going to talk about two things. The first one is automation, and the second thing is reimagining the economy with uh, universal basic income. Two seemingly not so connected things, but I guess you both know what I'm talking about. So let me let me run you through what 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 has been happening for the past couple of years. So there has been a tremendous movement happening in the field of machine learning. It has. Um, you know, developed some sort of a renaissance of a lot of research, a lot of paper, a lot of a lot of basically practical practical applications, uh, applied machine learnings, and it has basically led to autom automatization of a lot of things, and it will inevitably lead to autom automatizing a lot of things around us, especially human labor. And we have been hearing this from many many angles from Noel Harari to, you know, all the other ones, they're, they're saying that we're in grave peril because the AI, machine learning, and all of this will kill a lot of jobs. But the fact is that we already passed this um, almost a century ago during the Industrial Re Revolution. So, and then we have this current situation, quarantine, nobody's going out, blocked a lot of people, 
uh, whoever is not able to re operate remotely, uh, work their jobs remotely, uh, will basically lose their jobs inevitably as the situation unfolds and in and, and a little bit, you know, in, in the future. And before we had this status quo that says, you know, this system that we live has a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of injustices, but this is the best we got. So let's, again, not break it. Uh, let's not change it because it's not broken. But now it's kind of broken. And what we are seeing right now are two things. One thing that virtually all of the governments are jumping in with a lot of stimuli, stimuluses, stimulus packages for companies, but also individuals. Uh, what I was shocked personally was the U.S. government, the most capitalistic government of all governments out there in the world, and Donald Trump is very happy about it. They basically said, here's a $1,200 check one time just to get you through the next month or two so you don't you know, starve and go on the streets. So for me, it was a shock because it was a little bit of the, you know, it was a little bit of the experiment um, of a UBI, a user, like universal basic income. So my question was, can we reimagine or how can we reimagine the global economy with these things in mind? On one hand, automation, which is going to accelerate in the years to come, this situation which is going, which is going to amplify this. And willingness to experiment, the, the, the willing, willingness of the government, governments to experiment with these things in the next years to come. So um, what do you think? I mean, before, before we start, maybe just a short round of introduction, like maybe like 30 seconds for each of you to introduce yourselves and then you, uh, you know, explain your background, because I think it's very relevant for everyone speaking here. Listen. Okay, so yeah, I can start. Um... So I'm more like in the crypto UBI space. So this is like uh, a space where you have a uh, cryptocurrency projects, but that try to distribute a UBI, a kind of UBI. And so this is like kind of an experiment to be just like Bitcoin was an experiment to uh, try out a, a new form of currency. You, you can with crypto UBI, the idea is like, okay, let's uh, try to, uh, make a cryptocurrency that can distribute a UBI to each person. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Maybe you can try refreshing, just control or a refresh and it should, it should work because I can see that you have the camera on and mm, yeah. I can see you talking, but I can't unfortunately hear you try rejoining if you can. We tested this before and it kind of worked, but before you maybe, maybe, maybe press the space bar, sorry, maybe press the space bar because this is what, uh, yeah, this is what, what you helped me. <laughs> yeah. So um, while Andrea is uh, uh, trying to solve it, so my like, we're going to go jump into questions. So industrial revolution happened not that far, far away, if you look at the whole historical uh, context, and people thought that they, they weren't needed. And, you know, they're going to be substituted by machinery, and they will be starving. And, you know, homeless from all on because they would not be contributing to the end. In the end, it was not so. So mechanical work was solved with machinery, but we, you know, kind of uh, shifted from manual labor to intellectually elevated jobs. So, like, we are currently, like, in, in, in this situation. What do you think is going to happen with automation? Is it going to be exactly the same thing or... Because of, you know, our contribution to society, um, we need to, you know, think in other way. Maybe, Jan, you can jump on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't think it, it will be exactly similar because um, when, um, when the industrial, industrial revolution happened, uh, there was a shift from the industry to the service uh, industry. Uh, so, from the, from the manufacturing industry to the service industry. And no, this time probably a lot of service jobs are going to be automated. So all the um, call centers, for example, 
or um, consulting companies. The, uh, there are a lot of things in the IT, probably even in the IT, there will be a lot of uh, um, service and uh, jobs that will go away. Uh, in the, uh, in the, the, so the taxi industry and uh, all this kind of uh, kind of jobs are very highly at risk. But my so my personal opinion is that this will happen, but it will happen probably like gradually. So not like one day and all the jobs are gone, but it will be over like a longer period of time, probably the next 10 to 20 years. And we will not see it like directly, but probably we will see that more and more people will get unemployed because they will not be able to find something um, that they can do. And maybe what is going to happen is that something that is called, that are called bullshit jobs, they called, uh, um, become a new reality. So basically, uh, well, jobs where people do just completely use less things that could be automated, but because there's some regulations or the government says, okay, we, we cannot uh, have those, those people uh, unemployed. We will just, uh, um, make a regulation that, for example, the, the car cannot drive uh, on its own. And so that uh, has to be a driver, even if it just has to be there, like in case of the, some, uh, just like to control the, the, the machine, you know, the, the AI that is uh, driving the car. So this is one possibility so that you will get, have like probably a lot of, let's say we call, you can call them bullshit jobs where people are completely useless, but they have to be there because of implementation or you can go like what I think, and uh, it's a better way is go to the, the um, take the UBA approach so that you don't have the uh, bullshit jobs, but that people are paid even if they don't do uh, this, yeah, this bullshit job basically. So we have these bullshit jobs quite a lot. They're called like political political jobs when you want to, yeah. I don't know, make someone's uh, like uh, whoever gave you a favor. <laughs> so, but what's happening right now, again, what's happening right now, two things. One is that a lot of things are, like you said, being uh, completely automatized. So the, there's no need for those people. And before we would wait for their natural life cycle to go to pension and then die out. And, you know, we're not going to continue hiring, I don't know, uh, that type of uh, jobs anymore. And the situation where our economy was like black spots. On one hand, on the other hand, we have all these beautiful things, um, you know, jumping in uh, or in being prepared. I'm just talking about like very simple things. So I've uh, one of my friends has a startup that is doing like trying to replace the call centers. How by doing, uh, I don't know, some sort of a crazy semantical deep neural network that will answer your questions on, on, on different hands. And Andrea, I mean, this is what I'm looking at you mostly because my understanding is that your background is mostly machine learning and, and AI and applications of this. How far away are we from, from, from that? Because from what, the things that I'm hearing from him, um, things are going to get rapidly accelerated very, very fast on this. And I think we just lost Andrea. But to go back on this, um, to go back, go back on this one uh, while he uh, reconnects again. Um, so there are a lot of things that were kind of uh, on breaks. Uh, majority of the decisions about the jobs and transition of this. And UBI is a political decision, not a practical decision. Practical decision would be we have no mechanics to do so, or we have no need to do so. But the current situation is, the fact is that the world economy, the global economy was like stopped in its tracks. So there's no more, or like the, the, the economical activity stopped and it's 10% of what it was initially sought for. So inevitably, if you want to survive, the things will need to change in one way or another. So either uh, reducing the number of employed in the public sector or increasing the number of, you know, even like employing people with nitpicky, uh, picky jobs. So the, 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 the question that I was uh, actually trying to answer to myself is how far along is machine learning and practicality of this 
far away from getting you know to this point and we have andrea back let me repeat the question because this is directly connected to you you're uh, we're very happy to have you back um when we look at when we look at the 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 current situation two things emerge yes. one yes can you hear me yes loud and clear uh two situations emerge one is that we have these advancements in practical applications of machine learning which can make our lives more efficient more easier and reduce the number of jobs that we need on one hand on another hand we have this situation that we're living in right now where the, the need for a lot of those jobs is gone so we have a unique scenario where we can actually transition this and we offer those people with unnecessary jobs a form of a universal basic income until you know their life cycle of employment is gone so if, am i mistaken is thank you thank you yeah is machine learning so far away that we can actually talk about this or is this like decades away still in the form of science fiction so i think andrea is is frozen and so there was something maybe I, I was talking previously with, with Luca about this, if it maybe was a strong statement, but the reasons behind the UBI, right? That the, is it a way for the richest people to avoid this kind of revolution at the farm and people getting against them? Or is it something fair and necessary and the next step in society, right? Because uh, Luca was saying uh, economy has retracted to 10%. So who is going to pay for that? People that pay a lot of taxes, you know, and they're probably willing to do that. Uh, so, Andrea, are you back? No. No, he's not. So I was, uh, I was thinking about what I was saying. So, so people are willing to do that, but is it out of thinking it is necessary and fair for the rest of the people? Or is it out of fear of having this kind of revolution in the farm, you know, medieval uh, revolution? What do you think about this, uh, Jan? Um, so actually, I'm not sure how this was financed, uh, the, the thousand, uh, thousand two hundred dollars for each one. But if I'm, a, I, I think it was through the central bank probably. So this is basically newly printed money. And Print. so the, the, um, so it is financed through inflation basically. So. Everyone gets uh, new dollars, but the value of the dollar will go down. So you can buy less, uh, less, uh, less uh, commodities with it. Less, uh, less food. Yeah, less, I understand uh, that. Can no, you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. uh, hi, Andrea. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, now. I have some, for some reason. I'm in the countryside, so the connection is not great. So I missed the last thirty seconds, probably. Can I retake my brief discourse? Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Sorry about that, Jan. We're going to come back to you, but uh, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, the floor you. is yours. Uh, thank you. Luca. Well, the, mm, there is a lot of misconception about AI and, and machine learning. Uh, my joke is usually that, uh, of course, all those useless jobs are those who cannot be replaced because uh, there's no machine able to, to, to feign, to fake work, of course. But uh, um, other than that, uh, there is a, a deep philosophical question in all this, uh, that is uh, whether... Um, whether machines can replicate uh, consciousness in three uh, forms, which are, uh, of course, intentionality, rationality, uh, and uh, actual, um, uh, how to say, uh, consciousness, which is called uh, qualia. Uh, strong arguments are that artificial intelligence is just a machinery that cannot, cannot replicate any of the, of the three aspects of consciousness. The literature is vast. I think there is uh, uh, too much, uh, too much uh, uh, belief that uh, the machines will be able to uh, carry out uh, in intentionality and uh, moral decisions in our days. Uh, what we are um, witnessing is a one of the many transformations of, uh, of economy where many uh, mechanical works are uh, shifting from uh, human labor to, to automation. And I think the, as in every innovation, and we are in a time of fast innovation, um, uh, the, the economy will be able to absorb uh, the changes. 
uh, whether the state, uh, by means of a UBI, uh, is uh, should be in charge of providing a universal basic income uh, to help those uh, who are in need uh, is again a, a matter of, of debate. Uh, in terms of uh, um, of the economic perspective, macroeconomic, of course, I can quote uh, Laffer, uh, Professor Laffer, who said, "Well, if you take money from people who work and give the give it to." People who don't work, uh, what do you expect uh, the, uh, the GDP to go up or down? Of course, uh, the UBI is a, a temporary solution uh, which uh, makes some sense uh, in certain uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, so I believe the automation is is far away, in my opinion. Uh, uh, it boils everything boils down to the principle of trash in, trash out. So AI, in, and I finish now. In my definition, uh, and not only mine, uh, is uh, a, a set of algorithms and techniques uh, which are aimed and often able uh, to solve uh, uh, problems that uh, uh, are uh, normally or uh, usually uh, solved by humans. Uh, whether this uh, replaces uh, uh, human beings in a large sector of, of the economy, uh, this is uh, yet to be to be seen. I believe. Uh, on, and then uh, finally, a consideration on uh, on the previous. Uh, uh, on the previous uh, um, chats, uh, of course, uh, uh, everything is about incentives. The UBI uh, can be a, uh, a, a, dis a, a negative incentive to, to work. You know, if, if you're making uh, uh, if you're making uh, two thousand uh, whatever pesos whatever, or, or dollars per month, and uh, they offer you a fifteen hundred uh, universal basic income, then you might give up work and chill out for for a bit less. Uh, of course, uh, the whole point is to uh, produce wealth for everyone, otherwise there won't be wealth for those in need. So this has to be handled very, very carefully. So now I, I finish for the moment, but uh, that's my take. There are some questions that I so need to ask. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. And I was about to po point this. Two things, uh, three actually. Fun is um, Raghu. Uh, Raghu is joining us from India. I feel like the call center thing is already happening. And last year, Google I.O. showcased the voice assistant that would schedule appointments for you. It was indistinguishable from, from the real person. So um, is it real or is it something that they kind of just, uh, I don't know, hyped up to be something um, as real? Again, question to Andrea for you, I guess. Oh, thank you. No, well, it's a good question. Uh, I didn't say that uh, automation is not happening. Automation is, is as... Uh, uh, innovation in automation is uh, as fast uh, uh, as it uh, ever uh, was, uh, but of course uh, it's like a industrial revolution. Uh, uh, the 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 jobs shifted. We haven't witnessed a uh, uh, the masses of people out of jobs uh, with the industrial revolution. In fact, it created jobs. Uh, we probably believe agriculture is another example. Uh, in fact, with Pomidoro, we are involved in agriculture, not not in automation but in the market, and then if you allow me another 45 seconds, I'll tell you my perspective also on that. Um, so, uh, yes, the automation, uh, the automation is happening. What I'm saying is that uh, there is a core set of, uh, of uh, skills that are necessarily human. Uh, they can be inputted to, given as input to whatever AI algorithms, uh, yet the human, uh, um, human action, as uh, von Mises would call it, is always... Uh, backed by uh, by human uh, intentionality rationality uh, and so that uh, that cannot be replaced i think the many authors you mentioned harari for example uh, these guys uh, uh, and many others believe that uh, machines will be able to replace for example uh, uh, decisions okay uh, but decisions are not uh, even, even if the uh, machines are able to to reproduce uh, rationality which i'm very much doubtful about uh, they won't uh, be able to represent to, to, to replace, for example, um, ethical decisions. Uh, those are uh, uh, clearly uh, decisions that cannot be left to, to machines. Uh, of course, you can input some principles into the machines, but uh, you cannot leave those to machines. So we are uh, witnessing, uh, uh, of course, uh, the question is well uh, founded. Uh, we are witnessing a lot of uh, uh, introduction in automation. This does not mean that uh, we will end up uh, being uh, replaced uh, uh, to, to any major extent uh, by machines in key in key decision. We are a human society, and uh, machines are not uh, consciousness. Uh, 
I understand your point, Andrea, but, but uh, still, those very ethical or the will be my solve or shortly. But the the level of automation that we are having is definitely going to affect the the job positions. I agree with you that this also already happened in the industrial revolution, and people were reconverted into something more useful. Um, and pro I am hopeful that this will happen again. But I think that in the process, many people are going to be uh, out of jobs, out of money. So that that's where the and, and maybe I could uh, connect to the, the question that I was uh, making to Jan uh, Jan when you disconnected, which is, um, and Gabriel is also asking in the chat, UBI is just for those who are in need. Is it for everyone? And my question was. Uh, a little bit strong maybe but it was um is it a way for the richest people you know for the, the the richest people in the world to prevent having like this revolution in the farm and getting people against them so uh or, or something that it's needed and it's fair to go through this process or something maybe in your opinion it's absolutely not going to happen the ubi is is uh, um, uh, impossible to to execute um and then I'm separating UBI from what Donald Trump did, right? This was a one thing uh, situation, $1,200. That is not UBI. That is uh, something on your back to say, get a grip, uh, things will go smoother later on, but it's not UBI. I'm talking of the deep uh, concept. So what do you guys, both of you think about it? Uh, yeah, and go ahead if you, uh, I have spoken for quite a while now. Okay, yeah. Um, um, so I think UBI is for everyone, not only for the poor people, because I mean, it's, so it's UBI is unconditional, un, uh, how to say it? Um, there's no condition attached to it. So everyone gets it, even if you're like a millionaire or billionaire, you will still get it. But of course, basically, yeah, this is like just like uh, what's um, kind of a negative uh, tax, basically, because you will have to pay it back uh, to taxes. And so this is not social welfare, because for, for social welfare, you have there are a lot of uh, things you have to uh, comply with. You have there's a lot of paperwork. And uh, so actually there are many people, for example, also that have the right to uh, to get a social wel uh, welfare. Uh, and they just, because of all the uh, paperwork, they are not able to get it. Um, this is a case of, of many um, homeless people also, for example. Um, so this is um, much better, I think, than social wel welfare itself. And you, you have, don't have all the expenses you have uh, for the government to check uh, if uh, if the person really has the right to have this uh, social welfare and so on. So the, sim the system is much simpler. And um, if we will see it happening, I I don't know if we will see it ha happening anytime soon. Also, there was like one candidate uh, in France that was running for the presidency that wanted to implement it. He didn't score very well. I think he was under 10%. But, and then there was also Andrew Young this year who tried to, to get uh, the nomination for the Democratic Party. But I think it's too early still. But, like, uh, you know, things like what Donald Trump did, this is like a first move towards this, this idea. Because there are many people that say, still think we cannot finance it, it's too, too expensive. And maybe if we, um, do little steps towards this, like Donald Trump did. Maybe this will get more acceptance, and um, if more problems arise with uh, IE uh, destroying jobs, then maybe in 10 years, this is something uh, that could go mainstream. Um, interesting that everybody's looking at um, Donald Trump as the you know the pusher for UBI. Um, I think it's uh, it's a, it's it's just a consequence of the situation. So I think it's uh, uh, to both of you, but more inclined a little bit to to Jan. Is universal basic income just or just does it doesn't it enhance inequalities and deepen the gap between the classes? I see a contrarian question coming looming from there. So, difficult want to, want to take question, a, a because, so, 
Um, so one problem with UBI is because is that everyone will get, for example, the same amount, but maybe so not everyone needs the same amount. So if you live like in a in a city like Paris, you, you have much more expenses than you have if you live like a uh, countryside uh, in somewhere in the countryside of France. So, and this is basically uh, the same everywhere. So it's, I mean, it's not a, probably not a perfect system, but I think it's uh, it's a better one. It's not the, the best one, but it's, I think it's a better one. And um, yeah, I mean, one thing I want later also to ask to Andrea, because uh, he's like in IE, there's one uh, other interesting uh, crypto UBI project where people, they have to solve uh, IE captures, uh, so IE resistant captures um, to prove they are human. And then they also get like a crypto UBI. And yeah, maybe this is something because they have like an uh, IE uh, challenge where you can earn some some decent amount of money. So yeah, this is maybe something, maybe I will, I will talk just right later to, uh, to Andrea, because it's something that might be interesting for him. All, all this is very interesting. I understand Jan's uh, points. Uh, he, he knows about UBI uh, better than I do. Uh, whether it's just, the question is very good. Uh, as I said, this boils down to the principle whether uh, the state should be in charge of helping the, those in need. And I, uh, I'm sure we all agree on the principles that we need to help uh, those in need. Uh, the basic principle on this, in my personal take, is the principle of the Good Samaritan who forked money out of his own pocket rather than paying some tax and, uh, and say, OK, the government will think about it. So he, he, uh, he acted uh, from his personal finances, of course, to help the, the, poor, uh, the poor Jew on the road. So uh, private uh, help uh, is uh, the, the, the one that we should rely upon uh, the most. Uh, and uh, the state might intervene in certain emergency situations. Uh, that's my take. Um, whether universal income is just, uh, it's not clear. Uh, if, you, if the state uh, inflates its, its spending and uh, borrows uh, and, uh, money, but, uh, uses debt to fund uh, as, the, uh, as the US are doing or the, or the um, European Union are doing in these, uh, in these uh, troublesome days, uh, this means that uh, uh, with a uh, with a, a huge uh, which, uh, with a huge uh, minting uh, emission of, of new cu of currency, uh, this will all impact those uh, poor low income people who are trying to ma uh, amass a little bit of savings uh, to survive through difficult times. The, the, those savings will be will be devalued, uh, which is why uh, there are things like uh, Bitcoin, which are, have a limited supply, not controlled by uh, central banks, uh, which are corporations. So uh, I understand that. Uh, 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 we need to help those in need. Jan thinks the universal income is the not perfect but best way. I'm not sure whether uh, this uh, expense is sustainable. And uh, as I said, these um, uh, subsidizing uh, have uh, a, a very dangerous impact on incentive, which was uh, one uh, the topic of uh, I mean, one of the topics of, uh, of the previous chats. Uh, because of course, if you are not uh, if you have no incentive to to go and produce wealth, uh, because the universal income is too high, uh, then uh, there's not going to be wealth for uh, for uh, for everyone. Similarly to uh, where, whether there is a um, there is a food for, for example, if in the United States there is food for uh, 50 millions and there are 100 to 330 millions, no matter how much money you print, uh, there will still be food for 50 millions rather than uh, 330 millions. So. Uh, uh, we, we both agree on the fact that we need to help uh, the poor and the, those in need especially, but how this is going to be done is a, a matter of discussion and uh, uh, of course any large uh, spending by, by governments uh, needs to be handled with extreme care. Um, this is something I want to jump on. Um, so this argument that um, People will still at home if they get like a, a UBI that is too high. Um, there's one quite f uh, interesting story that uh, the, uh, the, um, the steam uh, the, the steam engine. So I don't know if uh, if you understand what I mean. It was almost invented. So it was partially invented uh, by the ancient Greeks. Uh, so this is 2000 years ago. And uh, so the industrial revolution could have happened uh, 2000 years ago already and not uh, 300 years ago. And uh, one of the main uh, 
theories why it didn't happen is that they had uh, slaves, so they had basically so cheap labor that they had actually actually no, absolutely no interest into the, uh, developing the steam power because they had like uh, very cheap uh, human labor power. And uh, so I think that if the the price of human labor goes uh, goes up because people they have like uh, a UBI is like, uh, uh, that is quite high. So if if you don't pay them well, they will not come to work for you. This could also be like a big catalyzator to uh, to improve automatization because if you have to pay like a lot of money for someone like to 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 drive a taxi, then probably if you're like a, a taxi company. You will be very, very interested into having this thing automated, right? Because right now, it's not even sure if this will really make like economical sense. If you buy like a very expensive self-driving car, it's not sure if this will be very, very uh, a, a good investment because you could like uh, buy a cheaper car, and if you have like someone that you don't pay a lot of money, uh, a cheap Uber driver, it's not sure that actually uh, the uh, the self-driving car will will, will have a, a benefit. So I think, for example, in Africa, you you will not have self-driving cars because you will have like people that will uh, drive there for uh, one euro a day. So there's no way you can. This is what's happening exactly right now. But I think just let me connect it to again Balkans coming from Croatia. A lot of like brain drain coming outside of this, and this is exactly what's happening currently right now. Because of all the people who stopped working currently in my country and moved away some, uh, somewhere else, you can imagine if they got the UBI, they just stopped working. The wages of everyone else started rising because nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to work and, and there still needs in jobs. And I think the balance here is very similar. So if more and more UBI uh, is being introduced, the wages for the remainder of the population throughout the time where, you know, like labor is necessary, things will even out. But let me connect it to the question from the from the chat. Uh, the scientist uh, asked, so the thing that you're talking about would be very difficult, like countries like the Philippines, where a huge population are below the poverty line, the middle class is thin, and the rich class has plenty of ways to get out of tax obligations. Not sure how this will go. I'm guessing in what way you could find in something like this. So anybody wants to take a crack at it? I can if you if, if you don't want. I mean, I have an answer to this. So, I mean, the, the the thing that is currently happening, if you look at like a lot of countries, you have these tax havens and you have these bailouts. So, none of the big companies who have um, you know do, who have domicile in those tax havens will get covered by the bailouts. The bailout is kind of like a social scheme saying if shit hits the fan and it did, we like the collective will help you. But they exploited this collective by domiciling somewhere else and hoarding the, the, this thing. And this is exactly the same thing. So this is a self-regulating mechanism that will hopefully, you know, help. Am I wrong? Uh, I think uh, increasing spending is very risky, as I said. Uh, there is too much focus on, on getting tax uh, as if the state uh, had the objective of, uh, uh, as uh, one former king of France said, uh, uh, getting as much uh, uh, as uh, as it can, so, which means uh, plucking as many feathers from the duck um, with the, with the least number of shrieks. Um, and now ducks uh, learn to fly, so they fly <laughs> to places where they pay less tax. Uh, I think that the the role of the state uh, uh, should be uh, to um, to uh, to have the, a, a small footprint on uh, human production, so as to increase. Uh, uh, wealth and when there is wealth then this wealth can be uh, used uh, uh, more effectively to help those in need uh, as we know in the absence of wealth uh, even if you even up all the income uh, then uh, the, the absence of wealth uh, this is going to end up uh, badly uh, with everyone poor so uh, and if I am allowed a more general uh, point which uh, somehow goes beyond and above the, the questions here is that with the focus on production one of the real revolutions in uh, uh, in uh, of the AI world and the information world we live in would be the uh, increase of information. Uh, with the increase of information, every small uh, uh, pensioner, most small income, uh, uh, low income person uh, will be will have access to market because he can be known better. 
uh, to the buyers. So in the uh, in the um, in the light of the sort of supply side of the economy, uh, when you have uh, uh, pro- even small producers who are able to place themselves on the market in a decentralized way, especially in food, which is the field I'm operating now with Pomidoro, uh, then that will will uh, hopefully mean a, a, a larger uh, increase of production, uh, lower prices of food, uh, thanks to the information provided by, by the new uh, technologies. And I cite only an, an old paper, I think of the 90s, in economics, where these um, Indian fishermen in Kerala, I think, um, they uh, got uh, suddenly access to mobile phones and they started checking, of course, with phone calls, uh, uh, calling different uh, people in the poor different towns to understand where their catch had the highest price because that's the, where they would go. And with this increase of information, the, the income of the fishermen went uh, drastically up and the consumer prices went down. So the market basically became more efficient. Now, without any intent of lecturing you on this, I think the real revolution, uh, uh, in my opinion, would not be of uh, redistribution, but uh, rather uh, the real te- te- technological and AI revolution will have to help production by allowing even very small producers uh, in areas where uh, decentralization can be beneficial to enter the market and increase the general wealth uh, to the benefit of everyone, especially the, the low-income uh, people uh, which are on the brink of poverty, which are many, unfortunately, in some countries. Good. Thank you, uh, Andrea. We have um, some interesting inputs in the uh-huh. chats. So, um, Leah is, is saying, in America, the national anthem narrative is that if you don't have something, you have not worked hard enough. This is a deep-rooted economic class structure that not only separates the haves as have-nots versus the have-nots, but even more so divides and pits the middle. An example, working class from the poor. So what do you feel about this statement, uh, Jen or Andrea, whoever wants to answer? Um, Andrea? Well, uh, it is true. I uh, strongly disagree with this ideology. I don't want to elaborate on the, on the philosophical uh, and ideological background behind this, uh, uh, this opinion. Uh, yet, um, uh, of course, we have to cope with an amount of inequality. Uh, inequality is uh, what drives... Uh, uh, what drives, of course, uh, the production of wealth. Uh, so, if you, <clears throat> there is a, a Professor Laffer made a, a sort of a, a philosophical experiment or economic uh, mental experiment. So, if you take the average income and you pay everyone the average income, uh, you subsidize everybody below the average income up to the average income, and you tax everyone above the average income down to the average income, then you would have perfect equality. But no one would work the day after. Uh, so uh, the point is not inequality, but uh, whether everyone has a. Uh, and now I step into a sort of a moral aspect, but uh, this is inevitable now, uh, where uh, everyone has a, uh, a, a decent uh, and a dignified life. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, the, the, we should think that the poorer are the are less worthy in whatever uh, in whatever sense. Certainly, uh, yet. Uh, uh, achieving uh, uh, the equal dignity by redistributing the income is, uh, to me, uh, wrong. I think it just uh, does not work. And also, just to connect to this same point, I think this is a lot of propaganda going on. Because, again, so this was this was true back in you know, 19th century, early 20th century. You could move your up your way up to to a class by working really, really hard, saving a lot of things and things like this. But this is no longer the case. Um, I mean, we're living in the 21st century. We are living in the world of cryptocurrencies, world of wealth creation, and basically whatever you want to call it, like there's a lot of things that are not the same. And I think one of the earlier speakers, Vlako, said that we all default to our way, old way of doing things. And everything new is strange and, 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 and foreign. So... I think that the thing that is going to happen in, in, in America, not only in America, but I, I guess in all Western modern societies, is like challenging all of those old ancient narratives. And this is one of those old ancient narratives. Because, yes, before 50, 60 years ago, you could be middle class. You could work a, like a simple paying job to two parents working. And you could earn enough to get a house, 
move your like uh, um, get your kids through college and retire very very nicely but that's no longer the case majority of the middle class is working two three jobs each and struggling to make meets end and this is deeply rooted you know so um in the current system that we have right now and the majority of the wealth creation is still embedded in in us there's a lot of a lot of wealth being created it's just not evenly distributed so that's the narrative of this so the us government just created two trillion or i think six trillion dollars I, I stopped following after two trillion uh because it's it's absurd the, the money making machine was quite um quite something so and this gives you a glimpse that's why i wanted to have this conversation um this is you know this conversation now people are getting you know um uh, explained in real time as things and develop how the monetary system works how the whole thing you know around us work uh, in a way governments decide okay we need more money that we don't have and we can go in debt let's create these trillions to bail out companies bail out individuals bail out these things and the thing that from the commons ceases to exist because this is created out of thin air and people's um you know beliefs are you know <laughs> no longer true if you if you say it like this you know there is an interesting input at the chat uh, from the scientists at chain and she says, or is the answer really not UBI, but to actually pay people proper living wages? It has to do what we were saying. Uh, if a person works full time, he or she should not be having problems making ends meet. I see this a lot here in Philippines. People work way long hours, sometimes with no days off, and then get paid 60 a month, which even in Philippines, living standard is inhumane. Is if this were the case, UBI might not be even needed. So that's in connection with what you are saying, right? Uh, you need two or three jobs. Why do you need two or three jobs each parent, you know, to get your kids through college and to be able to retire? Well, yeah, I, this is correct. Uh, Jan, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Jan's point is uh, is not that uh, UBI is a is a um, pure redistribution is more of an incentive even to maybe take more risks because even if you fail then at least you have the uh, universal basic income and I perfectly understand that um, the the remark from the chat is uh, is correct uh, and uh, relates to what I was uh, trying to express uh, that uh, if we use uh, um, AI and uh, and uh, communication and the semantic search as we are trying to do with Pomodoro for um, giving the possibility to almost everyone to, uh, to produce uh, and to, uh, to make a living uh, without uh, the complex and cumbersome uh, salary schemes of uh, even of large corporations, uh, that would be beneficial to the whole society because uh, everybody earning well can help their relatives and neighbors uh, without uh, even the need, in the need for intervention of, of, of the state uh, subsidies. Uh, so. Uh, as I said, uh, it would me, be like a path. private uh, charity. Pri uh, helping. Sorry, it, it would be like a path. You know what you're doing there with yes, AI. I, I it would be like a path uh, to. We should I focus on the supply to, to the incrementing wealth and to increment wealth. Uh, uh, so far in history, uh, the the most effective uh, way was uh, creating a, 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 a as free as a market a market as possible. So if we use um, we are trying, and I want to. I don't want to advertise our our um, uh, software and uh, company and efforts now. Please and advertise if you, it if if it is please relevant. Put so it in the I'm, because I'm very I'm allowed. Very okay, much permission. Pomodoro. Um, Pomodoro is a, is a way of uh, offering a new uh, food marketplace, which would allow. Uh, that's our vision. Not every producer, but including very small producers, even an old lady who has a small patch of land, uh, to uh, be uh, found on the market and to. Uh, uh, make a living or or at least increase their their income um, especially in countries where uh, food is extremely expensive for example in Africa uh, ma many households spend 50% of their income on food so even uh, saving 20% of that would be a big uh, a big uh, increase for them so uh, have, uh, helping the the, uh, the the low income people to uh, be on the market produce and get what they deserve uh, from uh, from uh, their work uh, would be to me the best way uh, though nothing is perfect no society can be perfect on this uh, in this world um, to 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 uh, to allow 
uh, low income people to uh, how to say to increase their standard of living, uh, no matter what the inequalities. As everybody has a dignified life, uh, inequality is a secondary problem. Uh, we, we're not here for say social well, uh, warfare. We want just everybody to live dig in a dignified way. That's uh, I'm sure was something we agree. Uh, all, we all agree upon. So the, the, the free market would allow that uh, in, uh, in certain sectors it is possible. Of course, you cannot decentralize uh, uh, steel plants because uh, you cannot do it at home. But for example, for agriculture, in many countries, that would be a, a, huge, uh, a huge change. And all the only information uh, making the market more efficient uh, could, uh, could achieve that in principle. So I, I strongly agree with that. Uh, and a final remark, there's uh, m many big food companies and supermarkets, uh, uh, for example, even here in the UK, they they pay a minimum wage to their employees. Now, if they pay minimum wage and an employee has three children uh, and one working person, then they cannot live. So what do they do? They ask for uh, help and social welfare covers their expenses. But if their expenses don't come from thin air. Luca has a very good remark. Uh, this is uh, money created from thin air is, is at the expense of, every, of everybody. You cannot create wealth. You can, you can only create currency uh, out of thin air. Uh, and so uh, eventually people pay a lot of tax and the tax go indirectly to, to the big managers who make a million a year of, of big supermarkets because they, they rely on their employees to be subsidized uh, by the state and then don't pay the right amount to the, which would be the market price uh, to their, to their employees. Awesome. Uh, two, two things before we wrap up, we like a request from me, but I also see it from Gabriel. Can you, can you comment in the comment section, the link to Pomodoro? Because that's very interesting. I think it's a very interesting thing that you're working on there. Plus uh, I'm an amateur, amateur farmer myself. So one of you, one of you. Uh, uh, I, I will share the link and I hope to maybe inter to intervene again. We were busy, too busy pitching and coding. So we don't have anything public at the moment, uh, but mm. uh, we will uh, in probably a few days. So I will be very happy to awesome. share uh, afterwards. Awesome. So just reach out. I'm going to share it with, with all of you. I think I have Gabriel's email. Um, and with this, I just want to thank both of you and everyone else that participated and, and stayed with us uh, for this long time. For me, it was very interesting because it brought up some really interesting questions. Uh, and answers, and some of which we didn't anticipate when we started. Despite all of the things that happened, like uh, with uh, with these online conferences, I think we're improving each and every week. And I think that you know, wrapping wrapping it up, there's one thing that w became evident. So there is an opportunity, but we have no idea if we're going to use that opportunity to to make it better. I think the situation is just going to continue as is as if nothing was happening and we're just gonna you know test things as as uh, as it goes uh with that thing said um the official part of the the superhero league is uh finished again jan thank you very much andrea thank you very much for joining us thank you thank you i really hope you're gonna join, join us next time or one of the other editions when pomodoro is active and ubic uh, uh is gonna be the i guess uh, more open uh thank you very much to everyone the official part of this uh track is over we're going to move to the networking area so league.superhero.com networking or you just go to the main site and select networking we're going to go there and hang out over a beer and continue discussing